the Joe Rogan experience. Uh, yeah, anyway, go ahead. You just got wanderlust, huh? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, yeah, I guess so. It was just a cool experience. And once you get that taste of kind of freedom, it's like a little bit hard to go back to a nine to five, I guess. And I could so, only imagine. Mm -hmm. I could only imagine mm -hmm. that feeling when you're 19 years old. And yeah. You, you, you know. And to go back to a cubicle. Right, right. Something no, like no that. No chance. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no. It'd be torture. So we did some construction jobs in Virginia. And then, uh, and then uh, you know, I was a young guy trying to figure out how to live a meaningful life or whatever. You know, what am I going to do with my life? And uh, Did you have thoughts? Did you have like an aspiration? Yeah. I mean, I guess to provide some context, I was, I'm like, follow a Christian path. So I was... Uh, uh, I, I, that me always feels like I got to put some uh, caveats to that. Like it's like I understand for a lot of people that means shame. I know you had like some mean nuns <laughs> beat you. As a child. <laughs> yeah, you heard that. Yeah, <laughs> and one I, one mean nun in particular <laughs> straightened me right out. I was like, all right. <laughs> no, so I know it means a lot of things to a lot of people, but for me, it was always like it was interesting because it was summed up in like in the Bible, like. Uh, you know, love the Lord God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. And God is defined as love. And so that was kind of always the core focus for my, you know, how I tried to decide what I was going to do in life. And at the time I heard of a guy that was over in Russia building orphanages and needed help. And so felt really strongly that, Hey, that was the right thing to do. How did you and hear I, of this? Uh, so I have a brother that's adopted. And when he, grew up, he wanted to find his biological mom and just tell her thanks for the <laughs> chance at life or whatever. And when he did, turns out she had another son who was going to go over there. And I met him and he told me about oh, wow. this guy. So uh, so I, I basically felt it was the right thing to do and bought a ticket for a year, you know, just a full year, go over to Russia and and I headed over there. And that was kind of how the next chapter, I guess, started in life. Uh, and how old were you then? Probably 21 or something. Yeah, 21. Mm -hmm. So 21, don't mm -hmm. know anybody over there, don't know how to speak Russian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was uh, that was interesting. I, uh, <laughs> Did you was... try to learn Oh, absolutely. Russian? So this guy that I was, that was building the orphanage is an American guy, but I went over there and I didn't want to live with an American because I wanted to learn Russian. So he sent me to a neighboring village with... Uh, these two families, both of them were like ex-cons and, you know, <laughs> had been spent Whoa. a lot of time in Siberian prisons, oh, but they man. had changed, you know, they were like super cool dudes. One guy was just covered in prison tattoos, one of the funniest guys yeah, I know, but he, uh, did they drink a lot? You know, they didn't, those guys didn't cause they had changed their ways, you know, oh. found God in prison. So they, uh, they took me in like one of their own and, uh, oh, wow. and I spent, the better part of that year with those guys learning the language and how much did you know before you got there? How much Russian? Nothing, just the Nothing. alphabet. Yeah, and so it was. Can you read it? Was it was brutal. Yeah, I mean, I could make the sounds because I knew the alphabet, but I didn't know what anything meant. So, oh, so oh. it was. Yeah, that was an interesting experience. Like just very isolating, to be honest. But also, it was. Uh, I mean, it was pretty cool. You know, in did you hindsight. learn to write it? Yeah. Mm -hmm, so you mm -hmm. could write things to people in that. What is that called? Yeah. Cyrillic? Is that what it's yeah, called? Right, yeah, right, right, right. So mm -hmm. you could write things in Cyrillic yeah, and yeah, you yeah. could read it as well? Yeah, as I learned, of course, I could pronounce out the words because I could read it. I didn't know what anything meant. Over time, I started to learn the, uh, of course, the guy I lived with us was just taught me all the prison slang and stuff. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it it's was always. Prison bitch. Yeah. <laughs> Great <laughs> so, Russian. Thank no, you. Just... <laughs> so, wow. So, um, that's a crazy thing to do to just go move there with no Russian at all. Did yeah. you buy a book on English to Russian? Yeah, or? but I found the best way if you ever go to a different country and don't know anything, just have a notepad with you and throughout you'll start to like get familiar with words mm -hmm. as you live in there. And then at the end of the day, I'd, you know, I'd write those words down as I recognize them. At the end of the day, I would look up the definition and just five to ten words a day to slowly learn. And And by the end of the year, I was pretty, you know, starting to get to where I could be comfortable. <laughs> so took you a long have a real time. conversation with people after a year? Yeah, yeah, it was brutal, wow. kind of. It was a long time to wait, but... Well, Russian seems like it would be harder than Spanish or oh, French yeah. because you have to learn those that crazy alphabet. It's so different. Well, it's the alphabet and the grammar so different. I, I uh, 
I, I, many I, times. I don't know anything about it. How is the grammar different? So you don't speak like, if you want to say like, I love you. You don't, it, there's no, f- there's no form in the sentence. Like it, you could say you love I or love I you, or, you know, you could throw the words in any dire- in any order, but the word actually changes based on its role in the sentence. So when you're learning the language, you just get all these words dumped on you and you have to like try to sort through, uh, you know, how it's formed. So how would you say I love you in Russian? No, you could say ya tibia lublu or lublu ya tibia or tibia ya lublu. You know, there's like a... Is there a reason why you'd say it in different ways? Does I think it... you could emphasize, you know, make different... It's, it is a flexible language in that, yeah, you could switch it up to emphasize certain aspects. Is it more ambiguous? Like, would people be like, are you sure? <laughs> say it a different way. <laughs> no, no, I think it, it works pretty good. How much do you love? <laughs> Is there, is there... You know, that's not a phrase I got a lot of practice with when I was over there. <laughs> so when you're up there and these folks have these uh, caribou uh-huh. and they're riding them and they're taking care of them, do, th- do they shield the other caribou from seeing one of them get slaughtered? Uh, no, they don't seem to be too worried about it. Like, uh, they're, they're like it's a very, like, mutually, you know, symbiotic relationship between yeah. the reindeer. And the reindeer... They're always getting attacked by wolves and tore up and stuff, and they always are coming to the people for protection in those times. Not only from wolves, but even from, like, mosquitoes and gnats. You know, they'll build oh. big smoky fires. So the reindeer know people are their friends and, I guess, uh, sort of are okay with an occasional, occasional, <laughs> eating. An occasional sacrifice. <laughs> so if they have 200 of them, how often do they kill one? They try not to kill them. Like, they actually really avoid trying to kill their own reindeer. It's that you're mostly living off of, you know, moose and uh, wild reindeer and oh, game like birds reindeer and that stuff. aren't theirs. Yeah, 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 yeah. Interesting. So, it, because these are domesticated, they, they just behave differently. It's so yeah. weird to see them, like, with saddles on and shit yeah, and people yeah. riding them. They're uh, almost, they've been, they were one of the first animals to be domesticated, actually. By Inter- humans? Yeah. Which really? Is interesting. So, they. Before dogs? Not before, but one of the first, first, I guess, yeah. And then they, uh, and they've been domesticated so long that they don't even know how to domesticate wild ones anymore. So this is crazy, J- Jamie. Go back to that. Let me see how they put up these yeah, teepees. It's a teepee. So is this? Uh, they they have this set up ready to go. Yeah. And they, then when they get to a place and they decide to, then they pull out the sticks. They yeah. Already have and the, them. In the summer, you're moving every three days or so, just following the reindeer herd through the forests. You know. Wow. In the winter, they everything's a little slower. You'll be in a place for a month or so, but just yeah, no mat, no mads. And what do they thing. do when the weather sucks? Like they have this this te- teepee you're just set up. Always out. You know it's. You're just out in the weather also, basically. When it's when it's really cold, negative fifty, you know, like mm-hmm. they have a little wood stove in the in the in the teepee and it keeps what I was the thing pretty warm. Asking okay. about mm-hmm. actually is the wind. Because oh, yeah. the, the way they have these sticks set up, it's like they have these animal skins that go over is that animal skins? Those are that's canvas. That's that what, is? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. This oh so it's it just looks like it's like right, a buckskin. Right. Yeah, so they have these canvases. Do they have loops where they tie it down? Right. Like, yeah, they do. And then they put they lean sticks on the outside also to kind of hold the mm. the uh, canvas in place. So but these it, people live so the, nomadic. Yeah, it is very nomadic, and it's man, it's awesome though. It's so fascinating to live like that and compare it to the modern world, like because not too many people get the opportunity anymore, and it's uh. You're so wired for it. It's weird. You know, like... Right, when, so your body just immediately I mean, falls into place for it? Yeah, you're, all your dopamine reset. You know, like, you'll be out there fishing, and every day you'll just be like, yeah, I got a fish, you know, because you're relying on it so much. Mm-hmm. And uh, whereas, like, in normal everyday life here in town and stuff, when do you get that excited, you know? <laughs> like, you're right. always... Uh, you don't have any schedule, so every day you wake up, it's like, well, what do I need to do today? And you can kind of... You're just free to choose. You know, you can go try hunting. You can go collect berries. You go find your reindeer. and exp- You know, like there's just a number of options all available to you. And uh, they're all directly related to your life. So you don't have any, you know, there's no money being thrown around out right. there. It's just kind of... I'm hungry. Let's go fishing. Let's go to that spot because it's cool. You know, what do, they, what do they do if they get injured? <laughs> oh, that's a problem. They actually have. <laughs> <laughs> so there's good and bad out there, and they just get, they uh, uh, 
they can call in a helicopter, but it's so far out. You know, it, it's going to be a problem. I've broken some ribs out there and had some – myself had some serious injuries that it just wasn't an option. You know, you just got to tough it out because there's – Like what kind overcast. of injuries other than ribs? Bro, oh, man, the – I uh, chopped my knee with an axe one time with cut a tendon that tendon Ooh. on the inside of your knee right in half and the uh my other knee had recently had a knee surgery so I was just laid up literally like three days I was just laying in a teepee couldn't move I had to roll over poop in a bag like <laughs> I couldn't it was brutal I, uh, but Jesus. then you know you they rubbed like pine sap on it and it actually healed and uh really yeah it, I, I could have swore it would get infected but they're just Packed it with pine sap. And pine sap. Yeah, <laughs> so healed it, it, right up pretty but w- fast. What happened to the ligament or the tendon like, that I don't got know. cut? I, it doesn't really feel it as bothering me, but I didn't know it was cut at the time. It was only later when I did a an MRI. Uh, yeah, they told me it was, but and so it never it was, healed. Well, I, I don't know what it did. They said it was hanging on by a thread. I don't know if it ever healed back or what. Wow. But you don't it, even care. You don't. You know, I don't. I don't out? notice it as being weak. So. I, <laughs> Wow. I've been bothered. My surgery knee hurts more than that knee. So just, what, ha- what kind of surgery? I see a couple ACLs. Yeah. Injuries. Yeah. You know how that. it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do. Yeah. So w- when you, one of those videos was showing uh, a net, is that right. some the way they would fish? They would, they Both. Dr- you know, you'd like, yeah, a lot of times you'd put nets out and a lot of times you'd just go cast your birch, you know, homemade rod and just see what oh, you is that what they used? Yeah, yeah. So this is... Um, this is a net. They would just move it across the middle of the river. You'd and set it and leave it. And they're just trying. They're just setting it right now. Then, How do they do that thing that they do on the ice when they do that when it's frozen? When they, it's frozen. When they cut a hole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they somehow or another get so that net to go through to the other side. You cut a hole. You cut two holes, and then mm-hmm. uh, you get a long stick, and you shove it in the hole and slide it. Then like push the stick under the ice. And on the one end, you have a string tied to it. So you push it and keep trying that until you get it to slide under the ice to the other hole. And when you do, you pull the stick out of that hole and tie your net Whoa. on the end of the other one. And you can pull so on the, the string through. The string on the end of the stick, do you catch it with a hook or something and try to uh, pull it up? Like, let me see if I can. Yeah, no, you just uh, you pull the actual stick up through with the string tied on the back side of it. So, so you just have to you have find two the hole, stick. Yeah, you just got to get the stick to, you might have to three or four times slide it under the ice until it ends the other up hole. where the other hole is. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah, yeah, it works good. I did it on that alone show. It was fun. Yeah, that's yeah, what yeah, I'm yeah, asking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that must be really hard to do by yourself because I've seen people do it on television mm-hmm. on those uh, mm-hmm. survival Alaska shows. Oh, right. You know? It wasn't too bad. No, it was, I, uh, that part wasn't too hard. <laughs> but, uh no, yeah. I don't know. It was all it's good stuff to learn out there with the natives and then came in handy for sure. Have you ever seen the Werner Herzog documentary? Yeah, that's Happy all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the guy, the native that I actually first met that I was telling you about, that Euro guy, he uh, isn't a nomad himself. He's a fur trapper, so he does all that. He, real similar to that Werner Herzog oh, documentary. Really? And actually, uh, where they filmed that isn't that far from where I was in Siberia. So he, one, yeah, I went fur trapping and with him one year he was kind of he showed me the rough ropes on a you know he told showed me a topographical map he's like there's a cabin there's a cabin there's a cabin uh through some noodles in each of my cabins <laughs> you know we stocked them with noodles and then he just dropped me off and said to see you in a month and a half or whatever and wow. so just was out there my had a stupid little oh they're wrestling there huh? you go yeah good times these kids wrestle a lot yeah, it's a good way to grow up, man. Always just outside, having a good time. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> the, the Werner Herzog documentary was really fascinating because as, as you watch those people and when they talk about like no depression, mm-hmm. they're, they're all happy, they're always mm-hmm. laughing, they love what they do, they enjoy what they do. But st- even though that's like everybody's goal, right? right. Everybody's goal is right, happiness. Right, 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 right. Everybody's like, fuck that, I'm not doing that. Yeah, it's, it, that's a fascinating conversation in and of itself because, you know, having been up there and stuff, I'm just like, man, this is an awesome way to live. If it was like my friends, my family, in yeah. that context, it's like I would probably choose that way of life. But, you know, then you find yourself here in America and you're stuck on your phone and, you yeah. know, and it's just so unsatisfying that it's it's interesting to experience both, but it's kind of hard to, uh, 
I mean, I mean, because you're in where you are. So my family's all here. Everybody's right. all here. We're not nomads, you know. <laughs> so, right. But it's funny to have experienced that way of life and almost think, man, that's kind of what we're made for. It's almost better. I wish, I wish I could implement that in some way, you know, here. Well, uh, I'm aware of that because people say it, but I'm not right. aware of it in the sense that I've experienced, experienced it before. It. Right, right. I've never experienced like just completely living. I've hunted. Right. And I've camped out for a week at a time yeah, or so. But yeah, you start to get a feel for yeah, it. Yeah, you huh? I mean, Maybe. sort of. Maybe I not. mean, I yeah. think it seems like when there's no other option, like that's yeah. how you're eating. Yeah. You know, we were eating Mountain House and, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, and yeah. when we shot a deer, then we'd eat the deer. Right. But, yeah, no, I. You, uh, you were speaking of which, um, you've read those like Quanta Parker and yes, stuff, movies, yeah. books and stuff. Uh, me too. And now uh, having lived with those natives, it's like there's so much good there. You see, like, uh, they really are happy people. So there's a giant um, difference between the people who live in the village and the people who live in the forest. And the people who live in the forest, you would genuinely call like happy people. Like, this is. They're knowledgeable, they're being productive, they're doing all this stuff. Whereas when you go to the village, it's just like everybody's drunk, nobody's uh. doing everything. It's like just a total wreck, especially villages that don't have any reindeer herding connected to them because they kind of don't have their cultural context to uh, remain connected to. So the uh, So at least in the villages that have reindeer herding, the kids can go out in the summer and live with the reindeer herders and kind of experience that. And it gives them a source of pride. It gives them, like, uh, the experience of living in the forest, becoming, like, kind of really in touch with nature and all that. And whereas in the village, it's just kind of a dark hole. Everybody drinks. In those native villages, it's like the statistic is that one out of three people die of suicide, homicide, or accident. So it's Whoa. just – and you feel it. Like, I've got some stories of that that's just brutal, too. But the uh, the – now you were saying that these people that live in the villages, mm -hmm. uh, outside of the the people that are nomadic, mm -hmm. th those people live in a real shitty way. They, they're yeah, it's rough. It's like there's a it's like unconnected to any other villages. You have to only get there by helicopter. You fly in, and it's what are they? What is their their job? Like what do they do? Um, some of them work like in relation to the reindeer herds, and I don't know. I think a lot of people live off of like grandma's pension, which you know in Russia is probably. Like hundred bucks or something, you know, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, some people work at the school and the administration It's just not a lot going on, but a lot of people are sustenance, like hunters, fishers, and trappers mm -hmm. uh, that live in the village. But yeah, it's, it's, it's so weird. Cause the first time I went there, it was just like, man, this place is crazy. Everybody's drunk. It's just like a, being in like a zombie land. Like even when the reindeer herds will come from the woods, they'll like run into their house, lock the doors, shut everything up. And then you'll just see everybody like marching over to the really? house cause, and then they'll start banging on the doors and the windows and the and the guys inside the house ah, get out of here you know like and just drunks it's just just drunks just it's just insanity like but it's and it's weird because then you take the same people go into the woods they sober up and it's just night and day it's so weird That's so weird and then uh but yeah it's but you feel see the effects of it so like i was telling you earlier it's pretty brutal uh when I first went to the over there, there was like a little, you know, a nice family. It was like Dasha and Artyom, you know, these and their two little kids. Well, the first time I was there, I got back uh, or I met the family. You know, I lived with them in their teepee and all this and that. And then I went back to America. Sure enough, right after I left, a tree fell on their daughter out in the woods <sighs> and killed her. And then oh. they, after that, got, you know, started drinking a bunch quit the nomadic way of life started living in the village uh i went back over there the girl or the uh the guy got stabbed in some drunken brawl or whatever and was in the in the hospital uh slowly recovered he had this big old gash with a piece of glass someone had cut him open with he slowly recovered and then went back to his village the drinking continued sure enough they killed him they took his body to back to the morgue which the uh uh, the freezers had broken, right? So it's in the middle of the summer. This body's there, but it was a murder, so they had to wait for the police to come and investigate, but it's way out in the middle of nowhere. So it took like a week, and it's like a week later. It was just brutal. We'd go over there, had to, you know, pick up 
this guy who's your buddy and his wife is helping me like dress this body because oh, they're basically Christ. like okay we're done with the investigation you can go and bury is him he decomposing yeah yeah oh, Jesus it's Christ. brutal i mean and the wife is helping you yeah and the wife's helping we like oh. took care of his body like pick him up and like the skin slips off and all that stuff oh. and then uh take care of, you know we took care of him buried it buried him it was pretty rough but then a year later, I come back. She had gotten remarried, you know, kind of starting her life again. Turns out he hangs himself not long afterwards. Oh. So, again, it's this woman who's lost two husbands and her daughter. She just her and her son. Oh. I just found out a little while ago she got too drunk, passed out in the snow, and died. So now it's just the one son left from this oh. whole family. And you, like, hear those stories often up there. It's, like, really rough. Uh, you know, but that's balanced with what is could be so beautiful. It's like such a s- juxtaposition because you're out in this life where you have like people are happy, you know, ultimate freedom, and they're doing great. But when they, but the village and the alcohol just does this whole other thing to them, and it's like these people who are so beautiful, so nice, so friendly, <laughs> you know, so open to you. Uh, but you just see him suffering so much from this scourge. It's like, man, that's it's brutal. Cr- it's crazy that the scourge doesn't extend to the people that live in the forest. Yeah, once they get out in the woods, you know, they don't have the alcohol available and they don't. But even if they did, do you think they would drink it? It seems like. Yeah, they usually drink it. You know, like when they go to the village, they get it and then they'll take go out to the woods and they'll drink for a few days until it's all gone and then. It's all sober. And they get back to and normal. Everybody's back to normal. Do you think it's a genetic thing? Like, do they have? Yeah, that's been a good question. I've thought about that. You know, there's that there's that hypothesis, like yeah. that maybe it is because that people have been introduced to alcohol more recently. That they're, they're not, uh, yeah, a, you know, can't process it as well. But well, that was a thing. It could there's... also there could, you could also have the explanation. It's probably a combination of both. That when you do, like, have a people that are largely stripped of their culture and they're like. You know, because even the Evenki, as cool as their way of life is, you know, they had, you know, 70 years of communism where they came in and they collected all the best reindeer herders and said that they were like uh, kulaks or what, you know, like the bourgeois because they have too many reindeer, sent them all to prison, you know, like collectivized Mm. all these reindeer herds, these family herds, they turned into like government herds, you know, so it's been like their culture is not completely intact. Uh and it's like, well, there might be enough cause just from that kind of thing to explain some of the alcoholism, but I imagine it's a combination of both, you know. Yeah, I've always wondered mm-hmm. that about the Native Americans, the same mm-hmm. sort of situation, right, right, right? right? Like how much of it is despair from right. them being removed from their normal nomadic way of life right, and right. how much of it is just the fact that they don't have the genes to process right. alcohol because they didn't evolve with alcohol. Yeah. You know, there's that story of Cynthia Ann Parker who's yeah. on the wall out there mm-hmm. who's uh, Quanah Parker's uh, mother. Mm-hmm. And she was kidnapped by the Comanche when she was nine mm-hmm. and then recaptured by the Texas Rangers, I think it was the Texas Rangers, uh-huh. when she was like 30 uh-huh. with a child. And uh-huh. she was begging to go back to the Comanches. She did not want right. to live like it. And she found the way of living that the settlers had was just pathetic. She right. hated it. <laughs> yeah. You know, they, the Comanche lived in a world where everything was magic. And, like, the sky was a god. The wind mm-hmm. was a god. Like, you, you mm-hmm. worshipped nature. You lived off the land. Right. You followed the buffalo herd. And then all of a sudden, you're in a village. Cooped up in a house. Yeah. And you Coop- got to... Yeah, yeah, and everybody's exactly. like pushing Jesus on you. You're like, yeah. Christ. Man, it's the same same thing over there. It's like, right, it's just a juxtaposition of yes. ultimate freedom and this beautiful way of life versus like you're in the village in this little house. You know, these people are never going to be good like in Russian society because they live in some remote village, yeah. no internet, nothing, you know, like, yeah. and then, but they're also the ones that aren't connected to their way of life are mm. also not going to be great Evenki because they've just lived right. in this little house and drank, you know, a bunch. So it, they, it, people get caught in that weird uh, in-between place. And but it seems like even if it's not cultural, there's some right. there's something that draws people to that way of life. Well, that when yeah. they live like that, right. it's very satisfying. Absolutely. Like, and as my for, as for my own experience, like, yeah, I'm not a native, you know, but, right. I, but I lived with them and it was awesome and it like spoke to me deeply yeah. same thing even on you know things like the alone show it's like oh man this is what we're built for you right. know like you really feel it it's it's uh 
you know, an interesting thing, like, I don't have, like, a great memory or, you know, I don't usually have good, very vivid or interesting dreams. But when I'm in the forest, you know, it's like I have all these vivid dreams that seem really meaningful and powerful. It's like my memory's way better. I remember people that I've long forgot. Just because you go so long without distraction, you can really delve into your mm. thoughts. And, uh, yeah, it's a fascinating thing to experience. And once you do, you kind of realize... You, you know what's missing and it was interesting at listening to you talk to like elon musk and as the you know m inevitable march of progress moves forward it's like we kind of lose things but we don't actually know what we're losing you know yeah, and so yeah. uh as far as like the natives and like one of the reasons i want to see them preserve their culture culture and their old ways and take it forward is just as kind of a, a memory receptacle so that as things move forward we can still connect you know with mm -hmm. with what we've lost because it is a lot <laughs>